Hello, uh, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm in uh, Quebec, the province, La Belle Province du Quebec, and I'm at a place called uh, Lac Loup, and uh, the, the the Lake of the Wolf, or Wolf Lake. And um, I'm going to give a little, I'm gonna skate around this uh, pathway through the forest, beautiful skateway through the forest. I did it last year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, coronavirus and just whatever else comes to mind. So uh, let me begin here. It's very, very scenic uh, route here. Just get away from the crowd. So here's where we are. I'll show you the sign. Okay, skating through the forest, Lac de Loup, Quebec. Okay, so what I really want to emphasize in this video is uh, some of the latest research on the uh, coronavirus and, uh, you know, transmission of it. How to stay safe. How do we, how, how do we suppress the virus and get society back to somewhat uh, quote normal although you know it's we're never going to get completely there of course because we've got uh, abrupt climate system change uh, looming and uh, this year has been a real doozy for that as I've uh, as I've uh, communicated hopefully quite clearly to you in numerous videos this year now in terms of the uh, suppression of the coronavirus of course, the key thing is that it's an indoor dit disease. So the vast, vast majority of transmission is indoors. And in, this, in that case, it makes the air quality crucial and the key factor. You need good air ventilation inside in order to have uh, many air exchanges per hour. And if there's any virus uh, particles in the air, in aerosols that are sneezed out or coughed out, and especially in the winter, the humidity is very low. So uh, the droplets that come out of your mouth or nose or from breathing um, that are carrying the virus, if you're, if you're a transmitter, evaporate, and then those virus particles can stay around in the air for hours and hours. If there's no ventilation or very poor ventilation, you could leave the room and somebody could come in six hours later and uh, be at risk of getting infected. And there's definitely some sort of threshold level. Um, and that threshold level of the virus that makes you sick depends on your immune system function. So personally, I take four or 5,000 I use international units of vitamin D. I take vitamin B. I take some multivitamins. I've got crystals that you can mix up in drinks or, you know, I like the gummy bear type uh, vitamin, multivitamins. You know, you really want to boost your immune system, especially D. D is a, vitamin D is the most important, I think. There's lots of new studies that have come out that show that people that get really sick with the coronavirus are uh, lacking in vitamin D. Okay, I've got a bit of a road jam ahead of me, roadblock, so I'll just go slowly here. Um, so how do we know if the indoor air quality is good? Well, if a room feels stuffy, bail, get out quickly. Because uh, that means, you know, for stale air, there's obviously no air circulation. But the easiest way to determine uh, what the air quality is like in your in an indoor environment, a public indoor space, is to get a <coughs> get a CO2 monitor. So you can buy very very inexpensive carbon dioxide monitors. Right, as you are probably aware, if you've watched previous videos of mine, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the environment outside is about 410 parts per million and then what you do is you measure the co2 you have a device in every indoor public space a little co2 monitor that measures the level of co2 if there's good ventilation in the room that level even with lots of people in the room 
should be about five, six, seven hundred at the most, eight hundred parts per million. Okay, call eight hundred a good number, which is double atmospheric. Okay, if a, if you have a stuffy room, that number is going to go up to a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand, and uh, you know that that room is unsafe. The indoor air is unsafe, even if you're wearing a mask. You're at risk of getting the uh, coronavirus. Okay, so it's all about uh, air quality and that metric. We can use the CO2 concentration in the indoor space as a proxy, if you like, as a proxy for the uh, level of air quality in that particular space. Okay, I think it should be mandatory that all indoor public spaces start measuring carbon dioxide levels. In fact, I, I could see, you know, big business opportunity for some company to make uh, wearables for CO2 level detection. Okay, uh, so imagine that it's a feature on your, in your uh, iPhone or on your smartwatch or just a separate standalone sort of wrist uh, wrist detector, you know, that measures CO2. It's very, very inexpensive now to mass produce little laser, little laser diodes and little laser detectors. And all you need for a CO2 detector is you have a, an infrared laser and that laser wavelength is fixed at a, a strong absorption line of CO2 gas. Okay, so we know the strength of the absorption line from the uh, spectroscopy of the gas. So based on the amount of light from the laser that is, det that is absorbed by the CO2, you'll have a little waveguide. So you'll have a long path length through the air of this laser and uh, the concentration uh, will easily be determined <coughs> to sub parts per million levels uh, accuracy using this little laser diode uh, uh, detector, photo detector. And that will give us the concentration in a digital readout. And that digital, that's the way to, I think, eradicate the virus. Apart from, you know, vaccines and things like that, it will meet, it will basically be a, a red alert telling you an indoor environment is safe or not safe. So you get the heck out of there if it's unsafe. So if we mass produce these CO2 detectors, um, then we can know exactly whether or not indoor air is safe, even with mandatory mask wearing indoors, right? That lowers the amount of virus particles. If they're in the air, it lowers what will come to you. And if you're a transmitter, it will keep the particles out of the air, or at least minimize them. Okay, so, you know, it's very straightforward. I mean, this is, this is vital information. I still don't see much go, you know, much, uh, I don't see many med people in the medical community talking about room ventilation, okay? Um, and I don't know why. So we need to change that. We need to get the medical people up to speed on this very, very simple way of protecting people and eradicating the virus, okay? So I can almost, uh, you know, it, it seems pretty clear. Just go on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. Um, I post a lot of stuff on this, a lot of the latest science on this. And I also follow a lot of environmental engineers and building science people and stuff. And they're all becoming, they're all on board now. I mean, I've been talking about this for six months, but they're all coming on board and realizing that, you know, that's the key factor, ventilation. And the other thing I did is, uh, I think I did a video about six months ago where I did an experiment. Okay, so I have a, in a small bedroom, I made sure the window was shut and the door was shut to the room. 
and I had my two cats, two of my cats, two of the three were sleeping on the bed. And I measured the CO2 in that room uh, and it had been ventilated and it was about the external level, 420, 430 parts per million. And then I started the experiment, I closed the window and I monitored the CO2 level over time. And just with two cats in that room, the levels went up to about eight, 900, 1,000 parts per million over the space of several hours. Okay, so that's the environment, a closed indoor space without ventilation that is a very, very high risk. If there's virus particles in the air, you're at very high, extremely high risk in that type of environment. And then what I did is I cracked a window. Okay, I just cracked the window. When I say cracked it, I didn't break it. I just opened the window the smallest possible amount that I could. You know, and with your finger down next to the gap, you could feel a little bit of airflow. But it's the smallest, smallest possible amount open. And I monitored the CO2 over many hours. And the CO2 level in that room stayed exactly pegged to what it was outdoors. So there was sufficient ventilation from just cracking the window a very small amount to keep the that indoor environment as close as possible to the outdoor environment. And this experiment, if you do this in the winter, you know, you're only cracking it, the window is such a small amount that you're not jeopardizing the heat. Okay, you'll get a bit of a, there'll be a bit of a draft in that room, but you're not uh, losing all your heat. Okay, and basically that's what we need to do to all indoor environments. You know, long-term care homes, they're notoriously bad because they're sealed up like a fortress. They're sealed up so tight and the temperatures are very high. So the dryness level is extremely high in the winter and with no air circulation, you know, people, older people, they like it warm. They like it very comfortably, you know, too warm in fact for most of younger, us younger folk. And this is why the virus spreads like wildfires in those environments. So we need to crack windows open. And I actually go as far as recommending getting a glass drill bit and just drilling tiny holes in windows if they can't be opened in uh, facilities like old folks homes. And you can always throw some little, you know, a little bit of tape over there or something, you know, when the, uh, when the virus is over, but in general, we need to, what this virus is showing us is that we really need to worry more about indoor pollution and about ventilation because as you may be aware, the normal flu is almost non-existent in many countries this year because people are wearing the masks of social distancing and uh, it does not spread to the same level that the coronavirus does. Okay, so the precautions that we've been taking have pretty much eliminated. And when I say eliminated, I'm talking about, you know, the cases of normal flu in Canada and many northern countries. It's uh, less than 5% of what a normal flu season would be. And there's a lot of fluctuation uh, from one flu season to the next. And anyway, it's like pretty much uh, eliminated the normal flu. Okay, so this building air quality ventilation, you know, it's, basically, it's the key factor. You know, and our buildings should be much better, you know, for, a num for huge numbers of reasons, other health reasons, and also concentration. There's been studies showing that when the CO2 level in a boardroom, for example, you know, that's sealed off, gets high, people can't concentrate. Anyway, thank you for listening. Happy New Year. Cheers. I'm still, I still haven't made it to the chalet. Oh, there it is, there it is. The chalet is coming up. So there you go, 15 minute leisurely, state, leisurely skate in the forest in Quebec. Wonderful, thank you.